There are a large number of uh, antibiotics that actually work by inhibiting the synthesis of uh, the cell wall. So obviously these inhibitors are selectively toxic to bacteria because mammalian cells don't have the cell wall. Now, uh, as I mentioned, there are many, many antibiotics in this uh, category. A large number of them are actually beta-lactams. And these include penicillins, cephalosporins, monobactam and carbapenem. All of these have the beta-lactam ring, uh, which I'll talk about later. Others that fall into this category uh, inhibit the cell wall synthesis through other uh, targets, and these are uh, vancomycin, phosphomycin, cycloserine, and bacitracin. All the antibiotics that we will see that inhibit the cell wall synthesis uh, end up having a bactericidal activity on the bacteria. Invariably, that causes cell death in bacteria. And uh, I'll explain, or at least I'll, I'll provide one theory behind why uh, inhibitors of cell wall synthesis have a bactericidal effect. So let's just uh, look at the cell wall um, again. We've talked about this a little bit before, but just to review, as you know, the cell wall provides uh, a shape to bacteria, provides a, a level of rigidity uh, to bacteria so that the shape is maintained. And that's how we're able to identify rod-shaped and uh, cocci bacteria. The cell wall also protects the bacteria from changes in osmotic pressure, and therefore the, the bacteria is able to survive in different types of environments. Now we have a, a gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative bacteria, and we've talked about this before. They both have the cell wall, uh, but there are a few things that are different. The cell wall is the same, it's made up of the same components, uh, which is peptidoglycan. Uh, the difference being that in gram-positive, the cell wall is much thicker uh, than in gram-negative. Gram-negative has a much thinner cell wall, but that's compensated by having an extra uh, outer lipid layer, as you know, that's made up of LPS. So in gram-negative, the cell wall is confined within what's known as the periplasmic space, which is the space between the two lipid layers. As I mentioned, the, the cell wall in both cases is made, of, made up of peptidoglycans. And peptidoglycans, as the name suggests, is uh, a combination of glycans or sugars and peptide crosslinks. The two major sugars involved uh, in this um, cell wall synthesis are N-acetylglucosamine or NAG and N-acetylmuramic acid or NAM. So I'll just basically use the abbreviations NAG and NAM uh, to refer to this uh, glycan. So essentially NAG and NAM are the building blocks of the cell wall. And I already mentioned that gram-positive have a much thicker, it's about 50 to 100 times thicker uh, than the cell wall in gram-negative. Uh, now what I'm going to do is focus on how the cell wall is put together um, and then uh, explain in detail how uh, the building blocks are placed in the cell wall. The cell wall synthesis proceeds in three uh, stages. And these stages are the cytoplasmic stage, where the NAG, NAM, and glycans, or sugars are synthesized. So the building blocks are synthesized. And then there are two antibiotics uh, that inhibit uh, cell wall synthesis at this stage, and these are cycloserine and phosphomycin. And again, I'm going to explain all that in detail in a minute. The second stage is where these bu building blocks are put together uh, and they're transferred outside of the uh, cell membrane and they're put together to build the glycan layers. And there are two inhibitors uh, that inhibit this stage and these are bacitracin and vancomycin. And finally we have an extracellular stage uh, where cross-linking uh, occurs. And this is where the neighboring glycans are cross-linked with each other uh, by a peptide uh, linkage. And this is the target, that stage is the target of all beta-lactams, uh, as I will show you. 
So now let's uh, go ahead and look at each of the stages in detail and I'm going to provide some animations to help you understand that. Let's start with stage one. Again, remember, this is where we're going to uh, build the uh, building blocks themselves, the glycans, NAG, and NAM. We're going to put them together at this stage. So in this stage, we have the first uh, glycan, the NAG, which is N-acetylglucosamine, uh, that's being made. And it's made from glucose, actually. So glucose, by many um, multiple steps, is converted to NAG. NAG is then converted to UDP NAG, where a molecule of UTP used uh, to have a fusion of UDP NAG. UDP NAG is then converted to UDP NAM, which is the second uh, sugar that we're going to use. Now, this conversion of UDP to UDP NAG to UDP NAM is catalyzed by an enzyme known as enol pyruvate transferase, and this enzyme essentially takes a molecule of enol pyruvate and attaches it to UDP NAG and we get UDP NAM. UDP NAM is then uh, conjugated to three amino acids or a tripeptide. So we get a UDP NAM tripeptide. And these amino acids are L alanine, uh, D glutamate, and L lysine. And you don't need to worry about these three amino acids, but what we need to know are the, the two other uh, amino acids. So UDP NAM tripeptide is then converted to UDP NAM pentapeptide, where two additional amino acids are attached, um, a pair of amino acids are attached. And these I have highlighted in different color because we do need to know those because they're functionally uh, important when it comes to inhibition. Uh, of cell wall synthesis uh, with certain antibiotics. So uh, finally we get uh, this UDP NAM that has pentapeptide or 5 amino acids attached to it and that's the abbreviation we're going to use. So where do these two uh, amino acids come from? Let's look at that. So these uh, are D-alanine, D-alanine uh, two amino acids that are attached at the final stage. And as you know, most of the amino acids available uh, in the environment are in the L form. So bacteria has L-alanine available to it. It will simply convert that L-alanine to D-alanine, and then it will conjugate two molecules of D-alanine to get this dipeptide, which it will use to attach to, to uh, already a tripeptide that's there. Uh, to give you the pentapeptide or 5 amino acids attached to the NAM. So in that uh, pathway, uh, the f uh, action of racemase is important. Um, but in any case, let's see. First, the dipeptide will be attached and we get this pentapeptide. So now let's talk about uh, inhibitors. So there are two uh, potential places where we can shut down this stage uh, of cell wall synthesis. Uh, one is phosphomycin. It's an antibiotic that's used commonly for urinary, urinary tract infection. And that is an inhibitor of enol pyruvate transferase. So that's how it can inhibit the conversion of UDP NAG to UDP NAM. And now bacteria has only one sugar, it doesn't have the other sugar necessary to put the cell wall together. So it will shut down. Uh, cell wall synthesis at that stage. So that's phosphomycin. The other antibiotic uh, that is important for this stage is cycloserine, which is often used for the treatment of tubercul tuberculosis. Cycloserine, as, as I mentioned, uh, well, as I mentioned, racemase is critical for converting L-alanine to D-alanine. And cycloserine, in fact, happens to be an inhibitor of uh, racemase. And that's how uh, cycloserine is able to inhibit this critical step where these two, addition, two additional amino acids are added. Without these two alanines, uh, the cell wall will not be able to uh, be able to put together. So that's a critical step. So there are two antibiotics that you need to remember that inhibit the cell wall synthesis at stage one. 
phosphomycin, which inhibits enol pyruvate transferase, cycloserine, which inhibits racemase, which is critical for the addition of the dipeptide onto UDP NAM tripeptide. Stage uh, two uh, is the stage where these building blocks that I just talked about, these sugars, NAG and NAM, are put together outside of the uh, bacterial cell. So here we have the lipid membrane. This would be the outside. This would be the cytoplasm. And there's a protein that's very critical for this stage, and it's called bactoprenol. So let's see how this uh, works. This is actually a lipoprotein that's important. So first we have this uh, uh, UDP uh, NAM pentapeptide, one of the building blocks uh, that's available to the bacteria. So first step is where this uh, NAM pentapeptide attaches to bactoprenol. The second step is uh, where we have the UDP NAG, the second sugar that's available to the bacteria, comes in and it attaches to uh, NAM. So now we have this complete uh, building block where we have the two sugars, NAM, NAG, and the NAM has the pentapeptide attached to it. Now there's an uh, important enzyme uh, called peptidoglycan synthase. And this is important because what peptidoglycan synthase does is it takes this complex, the two sugars where one is attached to five amino acids, and takes that and flips it out and attaches it onto the growing cell wall. All that is catalyzed by peptidoglycan synthase. So we'll come back to that later. But in any case, uh, the job of bactoprenol is now done and it can be recycled uh, back to its original state. And this recycling is done by an enzyme known as phosphatase, which removes the phosphate that was left when this sugar complex was uh, removed from it. So that phosphate is removed by the phosphatase, and it restores bactoprenol to its original state. Now this is important. Uh, this recycling is important because the bacteria has a limited supply of bactoprenol, and if it does not recycle it, then it will exhaust its supply of bactoprenol, and it will no longer be able to put together the cell wall. Now, we need to talk about a couple of inhibitors of this stage uh, two of the cell wall synthesis. The first inhibitor is bacitracin, and bacitracin is an potent inhibitor of this phosphatase. So in presence of bacitracin, uh, the bacteria cannot recycle that bactoprenol, and therefore it will inhibit the stage two of the cell wall synthesis. Another antibiotic that is very important is vancomycin. And vancomycin does not inhibit an enzyme by any means. What bactomycin does, it actually inhibits this process by which this sugar complex is flipped out and attached to the outer cell uh, wall. And it does that by just basically clinging on to the last two alanines. And la later on when I talk about vancomycin, I'll show you the mechanism. But it does not inhibit the enzyme. What it does, it interferes with this process by attaching itself to the last uh, two amino acids. So that's essentially uh, how the elongation and transfer process occurs in stage two. Stage three is where we have cross-linking of this polymers. So in the stage two, we basically have these glycans uh, that are being put together, and these are in polymeric forms. And remember, the NAM sugars have this pentapeptide hanging on to them. But other than that, there's no attachment between one strand of the uh, sugar and the other strand. And in the absence of that cross-linking, it will be a very uh, weak, uh, almost useless cell wall. So that process is extremely important, and that's where cross-linking comes in. An enzyme known as transpeptidase uh, creates a cross-link between neighboring uh, amino acids, and now we have these two polymers that are uh, linked and it becomes a very strong cell wall. 
the transpeptidase which catalyzes this cross-linking is also known as a penicillin binding protein. This is important because later on I'll show that there are many other penicillin binding proteins. Transpeptidase happens to be one of them. Now transpeptidase is very important to us because it is the target for beta-lactams. So all the antibiotics, including penicillins and cephalosporins, are beta-lactams. And all those beta-lactam antibiotics will inhibit the transpeptidase. So they act at the stage 3 of the cell wall biosynthesis. Let's look at this cross-linking in a little bit more detail. Here I'm tr trying to show you a one polymeric strand. Here's another strand. So think of this as like two parallel sugar strands and they're not cross-linked. And the cross-linking occurs between L-lysine of the one strand and D-alanine of the neighboring strand. So there's a, a covalent linkage that occurs between L-lysine here and D-alanine. But in the process of that happening, the terminal D-alanine of the target strand leaves. Now, it's important to understand that this is important. Uh, this process by which D-alanine uh, is eliminated is important. So if that D-alanine wasn't there in the first place, then this will not happen. So it's important to have both D-alanine, even though the terminal D-alanine leaves, it has to be there for this to occur in the first place. So this is the reaction by which E. coli have their uh, cross-linking occurring. Uh, Staph aureus, which is a gram-positive, does something um, a little bit more differently. Here, instead of just a L-lysine uh, being covalently linked to D-alanine, uh, there's an extension, uh, an extension arm involving five uh, glycines. And so the linkage occurs not between the L-lysine and D-alanine, but terminal glycine of that chain uh, with the D-alanine. Again, the same thing happens. The covalent bond forms and the terminal D-alanine leaves. And again, uh, you have to have both D-alanine in place in the first place in order for this to occur. 